The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's food safety webinar on agricultural water. In the first of this two-part series on agricultural water, we will identify risks that impact food safety related to water sources, practices that can reduce those risks, FDA water quality criteria and the importance of water testing, necessary records to document agricultural water quality, required quality of water for harvest and post-harvest activities, cross-contamination, and the practices to maintain and monitor the quality of water used in post-harvest activities. We will also discuss the latest actions by FDA related to agricultural water standards. The second part of this series will be held at 2 p.m. Central on November 9th. This webinar is part of a series of food safety webinars coordinated and conducted by the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative to help Native American farmers, ranchers, and food producers understand the importance of food safety and what is necessary to reach compliance under the Food Safety Modernization Act. Attendees will learn about produce safety, foodborne pathogens, worker health, wildlife, land use, post-harvest handling, and legal issues associated with food safety in Indian Country. The IFAI has also launched a series of in-person food safety trainings in regional locations. I encourage you to visit our website at indigenousfoodandag.com slash food safety for a listing of these trainings and information about how to register. The in-person training events will result in the award of a certificate. The webinars we are hosting will help you better understand these issues and will help prepare you to participate more deeply in the regional training events. We will not award a certificate for the webinar trainings. We're merely trying to broaden knowledge of the important principles that will be covered in the regional training events. If you look at the handout section of your control panel, you'll find the slideshow being presented today and other agricultural water resources referenced in today's presentation. I invite you to visit our website at indigenousfoodandag.com slash food safety, where you will find links to these resources, more information about our food safety trainings, downloadable copies of the presentations, and archived videos of the completed webinars. The issues we will cover in business practices, microbiology, and legal issues are additional information our experts think is important to have access to as a grower. All attendees will be muted during the presentation. Today's presenter, Dr. H.L. Goodwin, will take questions at the end of the presentation. Attendees can submit a question by using the questions feature of the control panel. We will also be conducting a live poll during this presentation. When we reach the live polling slides, I will provide instructions for using your mobile device to participate in the poll. The poll results will appear, appear in real time on the slide. We encourage everyone to participate in this poll, so please keep your mobile device handy. Today's presentation is possible through a three-year cooperative agreement between the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the IFAI to provide Native American outreach, training, technical assistance, and education to ensure compliance with the Food Safety Modernization Act. Our work is part of the broad efforts we will undertake to provide outreach, training, technical assistance, and education on food safety issues. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. H.L. Goodwin, the Senior Economist and Food Safety Director at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Dr. Goodwin is a professor and poultry economist at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, a Senior Economist and Food Safety Director at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, and the Director of Student Networking and Curriculum Enhancement for Bumpers College. He joined the faculty of the University of Arkansas's Center of Excellence for Poultry Science in Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness in December 1997. Prior to joining the university, 
He was the Agricultural and Food Systems Policy Advisor to the Minister of Agriculture in Slovakia and a Fulbright Scholar in Czechoslovakia. He was faculty at Texas A&M's Department of Agricultural Economics and served as the Associate Director of the Texas Agriculture Market Research Center. He received his Ph.D. in Agricultural Economics from Oklahoma State University in 1982. And with that, HL, I will toss the presentation to you. Thank you very much, Brian. I apologize for the delay. My uh, my menu bar or control panel disappeared on me, and I had to revive it. So uh, mm. I feel I feel your pain. It, it's back now. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll go ahead and start. Thank you very much. Welcome to uh, this webinar. Uh, in my mind. This is uh, one of the most crucial webinars that we'll have in our series, this one and the next one, because <clears throat> not everyone hires workers, although the owners uh, of an enterprise still have to obey worker rules, but you don't have to monitor anyone. Not everyone uses soil amendments of compost or manure or anything like that, but agricultural water is a key. Uh, part of the entire production process for specialty crops. <clears throat> Many of you uh, obviously are aware of, of the issues related to having enough irrigation water. Sometimes we have too much natural water. So there's, there's all kind of complications around the area of agricultural water. And so let's launch into what we're going to be doing today. So as Brian mentioned, there are two sections on water. The first thing we'll look at this week is production water. And uh, just remember, it's water used in contact with produce during growth. So you ask yourself, what if I use a foliar, fertili uh, you know, foliar fertilizer or some kind of fungicide or whatever? Uh, you have to have quality water to do that with. And we'll, we'll explain about that as we go on. Uh, what if I spray on to keep my crops from uh, spoiling on an early frost? Uh, so that's a whole group of questions. The second one is post-harvest water, water used during or after the harvest. We'll talk about that in two weeks. So what does this statement mean? All agricultural water must be safe and of adequate sanitary quality for its intended use. Essentially, that means, as we've seen all through this, that the Food Safety Modernization Act focuses on limiting the risk connected with pathogens that impact humans. And we've talked about how these most typically come from animal sources. So you might ask yourself, what's the indicator that we use? Uh, it's not that much different for those of you who have water wells that you use uh, in your home. Uh, you've got all the heavy metal types of things, but mainly coliform. And we'll talk about the E. coli and the indicators for that as we move ahead. Uh, and remember, we're only talking about today agricultural water, water used on growing crops. So here we go. These are our learning objectives. You can see uh, seven of them up there. <clears throat> and I want to focus specifically on some critical concepts while you're looking at these learning objectives. One is we need to know and understand uh, how to evaluate the quality and minimize the contamination of our three basic sources of water, those being surface water, groundwater, in public water sources and distribution systems. Uh, we need to understand what's required 
for agricultural water inspections and how often do we have to test our water? How do we sample it? We'll be looking at that. Uh, we also need to know uh, water quality criteria for untreated ag water sources used during growing activities that contact uh, produce, the produce crops. In other words, let's say you flood irrigate or you furrow irrigate uh, or you use overhead sprinklers. It's much different than if you're using drip irrigation because you're contacting the growing surface uh, of, of your produce. <clears throat> And uh, we need to, we're going to learn about and talk about corrective measures, what to do if your water has an issue. And importantly, as we have stated all through these webinars, record keeping, record keeping, record keeping. I know people are probably sick of that, uh, but you got to verify this stuff. You got to keep records to show that you're paying attention to what's going on on your operation. <clears throat> there are a lot of things that uh, there are a lot of concerns of, of production water. Uh, what factors impact it? I've already said it's largely exposure to pathogens uh, or runoff of some sort that would ha have a contaminant in it. Uh, so it's really important there again to look at what are <clears throat> your uh, sources of water and how can human pathogens be introduced uh, into this water source. So here are different things that uh, are included in production water uses. Uh, I'm sure we're all, we all know what these are. Uh, but we, we have to be diligent and stay on point to these sources of water. For example, you could even have, as we'll see later on surface water, you could even have a flood event that would introduce pathogens uh, into your operation unintentionally. So we'll look at that kind of thing as we move along today. So here are the three main impact points for produce safety risk. <clears throat> Production water source and quality. <clears throat> and there are your three types, public water, groundwater, and surface water. Testing frequency and sampling location. <clears throat> uh, this becomes quite simple for public water supplies and uh, similarly simple for groundwater supplies. Surface water is another animal and we'll look at that uh, in, in greater detail as we move ahead today. Your application method is very important. If water doesn't contact the harvestable portion of the crop, then your risk is enormously lowered. Let's say, for example, <clears throat> you're growing tomatoes and uh, you furrow irrigate or flood irrigate. As long as these tomatoes are staked up or trellis or something so that they're not laying on the ground in contact with that water, you have a much less chance to have a production risk episode than if you have a vining crop like uh, cantaloupe, melons of some sort, cucumbers. So uh, the type of crop makes a lot of difference. And the timing of your application is very, very important. And if you can, it's best to avoid uh, application close to harvest. We'll talk about that in some more detail. <clears throat> so here's your probability of water supply or of, of contamination of your water supply. And you know this is, is pretty uh, pretty self-explanatory. It's pretty much what you would expect. Uh, but again we have to we have to engage in some diligence uh, particularly with surface water. So let's look first at uh, the, the source of water that has the least risk, <coughs> excuse me, and that is a public water supply. When you look at this, because these are intended to be potable water for human consumption, uh, 
at the source, they're treated to meet microbial drinking water standards. But you know, some of the water systems uh, are aging. Some of them have issues with uh, openings or cracks in the seams of the distribution pipes. So just because you have uh, pure water as at the source doesn't mean you're going to have it at the end. So what do you, what do you need to do? What what can you do? You can assess your connection to the water supply and distribution system downstream. Test the water to see if you have any concerns about the water source. You know, go to your rural water system or your city municipal water system and ask them to show you and to provide you a copy of the water quality test for that particular, <clears throat> excuse me, for that particular water system. They all have to get these things tested and uh, you have a right to have access to this. Uh, and you need to have a backup plan if you think water in the system might be unsafe. Periodically, I have a, a sister-in-law, she and her husband live out uh, near Beaver Lake and periodically they will have a boil order on their water. It'll be issued and they'll get a phone call uh, or an alert on their computer, text message, something that says we've issued a boil order for the next 48 hours. That would tell me that there's been some kind of a break in one of the distribution lines or somehow uh, some sort of critter got in the uh, storage tank and died in there or something. But anyway, something's alerted them. So if that happens, you need to have a backup plan, particularly if it's in a crucial growing season a period of time. What about groundwater? Inspect your well. Make sure it's in good condition. You don't want a well head with cracks in it. Uh, you want it capped. You want it elevated. There's a, there's a good picture here. Uh, you want it, for those of us that are in more severe climates, you want it uh, a frost-proof, frost uh, freeze-proof situation. You want the land to slope away from the wellhead, you know, build that up some. You don't want water uh, coming from your field uh, and running toward the wellhead and seeping in. And uh, you also need to have valves that pre prevent black uh, backflow. This is a, a key thing to have these valves that, that keep you from having backflow, which can introduce contaminants. So here we go. Uh, what are those contaminants? <clears throat> uh, let's talk about them for a minute. Uh, if you're looking at your potential contaminants on surface water, uh, there you see a list of them. Wildlife, we think about that. Manure application, ag runoff, leakage of septic tanks, wastewater discharge, urban environmental runoff, and then here's the Here's the thing over here, things we never thought of. Uh, that's why we have to be diligent in testing our surface water. Surface water is the riskiest type of water, but it's probably the most pervasive and available on agricultural enterprises for irrigation use in many, many areas. Uh, so we need, to, we need to learn about how to prevent contamination. And like I say, I, I keep telling you, there's more later, but there, there really is. Uh, <clears throat> what is it? Look at the nearby land use. And if you're using a stream, what's going on upstream? Uh, are, is there, a, for example, a, a confinement livestock operation a, a mile or two upstream that uh, may not actually be in perfect compliance, uh, particularly during storm events or something else, to uh, keep from introducing pathogens into your irrigation water. So talk to your neighbors, work with them, talk to your NRCS and watershed people uh, so everyone can understand and minimize these risks. <clears throat> What's some more good things? Uh, developing diversion ditches, berms or containments to minimize environmental runoff, but for manure, compost, many, many of us and I use us here, when I was growing up on the farm, we had uh, some dairy cows, we had uh, beef in a lot. We also had swine and chickens. 
and but we had a, a quite large it's about a two acre garden where we grew vegetables and sold and we also had grapes and several fruit trees Fortunately for us, our barn area and our animal lot area was about a quarter mile from our garden, so we didn't have to worry about it. Uh, however, if you're on a more limited land space or if you're in an area with more severe slope, uh, you could have a problem. So be aware of these sources of contamination and monitor and control animals coming into the irrigation water sources. Uh, where I grew up in the Ozarks, many people would look for land that had a stream running through it. And of course, uh, cattle like to loaf in streams. And while they're loafing, they do other interesting bodily functions and uh, contaminate the water. If you're irrigating downstream from that um, on a, a vegetable or fruit plot, you got a situation. And so you're gonna have to fence your cows off uh, the stream or, or the, the pond and uh, maybe have a pump and have water pumped away from that to a tank somewhere. But it's something you have to be aware of and manage. I already mentioned these types of spring, uh, types of irrigation. <clears throat> uh, overhead sprinklers, this is the highest risk that you can have uh, because the water is always touching the produce, uh, whether it's a leafy crop or a fruiting crop, if you're spraying water, it's gonna touch what's going on. A surface or furrow uh, may avoid direct contact with the produce. So, but you also need to worry about splash. Uh, if you're doing that and then there's a heavy rainstorm and the water, then the soil is wet, there could be a splash risk. So you gotta be aware of that. And then obviously the lowest risk is drip, uh, drip irrigation or, or some kind of controlled uh, application so that the only thing it touches is the roots. Now, what if you're selling carrots? Uh, you got a situation. So you can't just have any kind of water going on there because if you're selling a root crop uh, that is a covered crop like carrots, onions, uh, anything like that, beets, then you have uh, a situation where you need to uh, be aware of the contaminants, potential contaminants in the water and manage them accordingly. So here's a little formula. Less contact equals lower risk. It seems intuitive, but it's good to remind us of, our, of that of ourselves. And so here's some questions. Is the water applied using direct water application? The answer is never, you got a low risk. If it's yes, you've got to depend on the type of the commodity and how much water and the timing, you could have a problem. Now, while we're on this slide, I want to direct you to the first document. I, I don't want you to open it, but I just want you to look at your, <clears throat> at your control panel. And the first document is Agricultural Water Decision Tree. This is an excellent, resource that has been put together and it's a yes no resource and you can go down there and ask yourself this questions that are on this uh, little four page decision tree and it will direct you as to how you should proceed uh, through on your on your water management and water quality assessment and the risk thereof so i i would advise that you take a good look at that Now here's something, you know, these pathogens aren't gonna live forever. They can dry out or the ultraviolet light of the sun can kill them, it can get, you know, hot, to, uh, heat and humidity can enhance that. They can starve out or there can be good bacteria uh, that uh, eat, if you will, the bad bacteria. Uh, but similarly, there are pathogens that can be protected for long periods of time and if food's avail available, they'll multiply. So, uh, you know, you can even have a regrowth area, particularly in leafy greens. And so uh, there's, there have been instances, uh, for instances last summer in Hawaii where leafy greens were contaminated uh, by snails uh, and uh, they weren't properly handled. And the result was some 
some rather severe foodborne illness problems. So <clears throat> you can't just assume that you're not going to have a problem. It's better to assume that you might have an issue and manage it very carefully. So what about inspection? You need to keep a close eye <clears throat> uh, on your water and distribution system. So from here forward, we'll be talking about good agricultural practices or GAP, many of you might be aware of, and what the requirements for water quality and testing and timing and so forth uh, are for your ag water. So one of the things you have to know is you have to know how water moves on the farm and that can help you assess food safety risk. Growers, uh, you ought to sit down with a sheet of paper and create a map that describes your water distribution systems before you inspect it. So, uh, you know, organize yourself here. And there's a lot of, lot of code here that I won't go through uh, that uh, you, can, you can look at <clears throat> on your own. Uh, in the in the uh, FISMA itself. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm having trouble with my voice. Okay, so evaluating water quality in microbial water quality profiles. The only way you can do this is by testing. You've got to test your water. And this testing is really not your enemy, it's, it's your friend. Uh, you need to know this. You need to know if you've got a, a water quality problem so it can be corrected. And uh, you, know, you need to understand that, that uh, your microbial water quality profile, it's a long-term management strategy for production water. It's not meant to just use for day-to-day -day management and decision-making about the water quality and if it's suitable or not. It's a long-term management strategy. So uh, that's very, very important. I want to point out something in this last statement. Determine if corrective measures are needed. If the microbial water quality profile exceeds numerical geometric mean and uh, STB criteria in the produce safety rule, we will not uh, wallow through this. There are some excellent resources that can help you uh, calculate these things. University of California, Davis, and the University of Arizona have some calculators that they have developed. And so I'm not, uh, I'm not going to belabor those statistical points as we go through, but I do want to mention uh, several things, one of which <clears throat> is that right now the timing and the method of water quality testing and the levels for quality water are in reconsideration period by Food and Drug Administration. Now, what does this mean? It doesn't mean we can go to sleep at the switch. What it does mean is that in the future, uh, there may be a different, uh, a different timetable for when you must be in compliance. May, they may have to give people more time because of the load it would put on water quality testing. Uh, they have also, uh, at, at first, they uh, FDA only approved one type of uh, coliform test for uh, water, and uh, that was method uh, 1603. But now they've uh, found that there are eight methods that are equivalent to 1603. And the problem was on that method, almost no labs use that method. I think uh, Florida had five in the entire state. So it was a real problem. So they found equivalent methods to test primarily for E. coli. That's the bugaboo. And uh, the good news is a couple of these methods or a call alert, their test kits. And uh, so some of these new methods, again, there's, there's a, a resource on here uh, that will be posted that lists these methods, but we're hesitant to, uh, to go in it 
too much depth because some of those things may change. So you, uh, I just wanted to point that out to you. <clears throat> so E. coli is the indicator that they use. And so here's sort of uh, the coliform group of bacteria. It's a little graphic there, and there's salmonella and cryptosporidium and hepatitis. Those are other collagen or other uh, pathogens that could be uh, present also in the presence of coliforms. <clears throat> and the fact is that the coliform indicates that there is a likelihood of these other pathogens. And so there's the subset of them. They use a generic. Uh, e. coli and to get at the uh, fecal coliform. So you can see the little, the little chart there that, that shows the indicator types. <coughs> okay, so now we will move to establishing criteria for water used during growing activities. This is a measurement criteria that will be used. Again, I'm not going to go into this uh, in very much detail, but there are what they call colon <coughs> colony forming units for generic E. coli. That's the indicator test. So you have to be uh, in these certain ranges uh, over a period of time. And uh, again, it's when you go to the trainings uh, in person, we'll cover this in more detail, but right now this is in flux. So just know that it's yet to be totally specified. And uh, hopefully by the time we, you're at a face-to-face -face grower training, <clears throat> FDA will have decided what their boundaries are going to be and what their testing criteria will be. Okay, so water requirements for public water. For public water, you've got to have a copy <clears throat> of test results or current certificates of compliance. So if you have a, this documentation, there's no requirement to test water that meets requirements for public water supplies. In other words, they figure if people are drinking it, uh, it's not much of a problem for them to use it for irrigation water. What about groundwater? Well, groundwater is a slightly more complex. You have to do periodic testing of your groundwater. It says four or more times during the growing season or over a period of a year. One or more samples rolled into profile every year after the initial year. These samples have to be representative of use and must be collected as close in time as practicable, but before harvest. So if, if you know what your irrigation schedule is, uh, plan, I would plan to take a sample at that same time. Uh, and uh, so you ask, what about sampling? I'll direct you to your control panel again, and there's one there, sample standard operating procedures for agricultural water. This tells you the type of equipment and, and supplies that you need to do this sampling. And then finally, sample water testing log. These are forms that depending on what your source of water is, allows you to record uh, your water test results for your records. So there's some good resources here for you. Surface water, oh, that's another deal. You got to do 20 or more times a year or over a period of two to four years and five or more samples on a rolling average year to year. Uh, so, and you know, you should, you should move your sample around. It's analogous to doing a soil test. If you're soil testing a field, you move your sampling locations around. You don't just put it all in the same place. So, <clears throat> Profiles uh, are very important there over a period of time. 
Here's a little thing. Where do I collect samples? Surface and groundwater, it's pretty easy. Water supply. Uh, surface and groundwater, you have to move your sampling. Uh, municipal water supply, again, you don't have to do sampling. Unless you know there's been a problem. Uh, you can get assistance on taking uh, your water samples. There's a lot of good material on uh, YouTube and on the web. You can get assistance from perhaps your uh, county ag personnel or your uh, water technicians. Many times there are schools uh, that have classes that are have been the children have been taught that high school kids have been taught for water sampling. But there's some very important things here on on the uh, this slide that talk about what kinds of things you need to do to prepare to take the sample. Information about testing. Again, I'm not going through this because it's changing, uh, but you have to take it to a certified lab that does one of these eight types of uh, water testing uh, that have been approved as equivalent. Make sure it's labeled. When you send your sample in, make sure it's labeled field one, field two, you know, uh, tomato field, uh, green beans, wherever you take this, make sure your sample is labeled because if there's a foodborne illness problem, you need that for backup and documentation of your water quality. So corrective measures, there are three types of corrective measures. Allow enough time for the, back, uh, the pathogens to die off between uh, either between your last application and harvest or between harvest and the end of storage. Uh, so, or removal like of, of commercial uh, washing, et cetera. So that's number one. Number two, reinspect your water system. See if there's a problem. You may have a mechanical problem, a physical problem in your, particularly in your groundwater supply, or maybe even in, uh, you know, you're responsible for the water once it leaves the pipes of the water system. So you could have a problem in, in your distribution there on the farm. And then the other thing you can do, of course, that, that's most involved uh, and the most expensive is to actually treat the water, but that may be the option that you have to follow. <clears throat> Application and timing, the key thing here to know is that if your initial water quality profile doesn't meet the criteria, this is very, very important. You have to know whether or not uh, your water meets the criteria that's been established. <clears throat> but what about you know, you always get this. Oh, I did. It's unintentional water contact. Well, that happens all the time. Uh, so, what are some examples? Emitters and other water application issues. What do you know about the quality of water? When is harvest? Same questions keep coming up over and over and over. Human mistakes. You've mix, uh, mixed some spray applications with untreated surface water. You didn't turn off your irrigation pumps and you. You, uh, you know, you you flooded your field and the water gets up on contact with your produce. And then here's the big one that we really can't do anything about, flood events. Uh, you know, if, you're, if your produce comes in contact with flood water, uh, it's adulterated by the FDA and you cannot use it for food. And I know that's uh, a problem in some areas and it's very difficult to deal with. Uh, but uh, contact with flood water that's not part of a natural disaster can be subject to provisions of FISMA produce safety rule. So you got to watch flood events. Uh, pay attention to those. If you are in an area that's uh, flood prone, even if it's splash flood prone or uh, flooding of a stream that overruns your field, uh, you need to be aware of that and take measures uh, to sort that and know that you may in fact lose the market for it. 
<coughs> Excuse me. If you detect a problem, you got to be careful until you've figured out where it is. Uh, and migratory birds are a big issue in our area of the country. We're starting to get the waterfowl migration, and uh, it could be that you could have, you know, uh, particularly snow geese, literally thousands of snow geese. Uh, there are, you know, you could have uh, large flights of Canadian geese or ducks coming over. So all these things, you got to be aware of this. You got to look at uh, leaching from a septic tank. I had a question two weeks ago about somebody uh, that said their their friend on the on the reservation had uh, <clears throat> had grown some beautiful carrots, and they had come to find out they'd grown them in their septic field. This is not uh, safe. There are pathogens on those carrots. You got to use corrective actions, and you have to be aware. You know, different states and counties and and uh, uh, may have regulations that could be in conflict with federal regulations. You've got to go with the one that's the most stringent. So uh, the main thing is have management in place. Prethink your possible problem and have management in place to uh, deal with possible contamination. Now here's one, treating production water. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, many of you may have, the only uh, water you have may be contaminated from surface sources. Uh, it could be in an area that's uh, heavily populated by, by wildlife, or it can be in an area downstream of other animal operations. It could be that uh, <clears throat> that uh, you are forced, not coerced, but your decision that you make forces you to actually treat this water. So there are some different choices that we have here. Filter units, UV light units, ozonator units, uh, Ozone has been used as a, uh, a decontaminant for, for many years, uh, so-called heavy oxygen, and it will, will kill your pathogens. Uh, be careful not to use water treatments that damage the environment. And keep records. Y'all are gonna get sick of this keep records, but it has to be done. You have to be able to uh, document that you in fact treated and monitored your water that you knew was out of compliance because you tested for it. So uh, that's very important. Here are some uh, some guidelines. I'll just uh, leave those there for you to, to view for a couple minutes. Uh, again, a lot of this stuff is uh, under review, but I'm betting there won't be much change in it, most of the changes will be in the numbers of the samples that are required to meet the levels uh, that EPA or that uh, FDA come upon. <coughs> and so that that will be the main thing that we'll be looking at in the compliance dates. But but these uh, I, I would suggest to you irrespective of what compliance date FDA finally decides to enact, you need a baseline water sample. So if you don't have one, learn how to do one, send it to a reputable lab, and at least establish a baseline of where your, where your water quality is now. Uh, and it's good, like I say, to do this seasonally, particularly if you're using surface water, uh, because in times when there's a lot of runoff, you're going to have a much different contamination profile than in times uh, that are more dry. So establish your baseline with an appropriately done uh, sample and an appropriately tested sample. Groundwater, you know, the, these three charts I'm showing you for surface and groundwater in the next one, will, it's just a good thing to have after you go through that, uh, Decision tree, these slides here, number 34 and 35, uh, 
and 36 that deal with testing and water quality, pro, microbial water quality profile are good things to have uh, at your computer or at your desk or hanging in your uh, uh, equipment area, wherever they would be more easily seen to constantly keep this at the front of your mind. I've got to have a microbial water quality profile, whether I have groundwater or surface water, and I've got to review my results. Uh, this is, you know, this is a protection against contamination and against the effects on your operation of uh, violating FSMA, whether it's intentional or unintentional. So if you get a water test back and you know that your water has a too high level of pathogens, take corrective action. Find out what the problem is. Uh, correct this stuff prior to your compliance dates and implement practices to reduce your risk. Uh, because when people get sick, they don't care who's, uh, you know, what the source is, they just care that they're sick. And uh, somebody's going to be responsible for that because FISMA specifies that you should uh, limit pathogen exposure and contamination. So get on top of this now before compliance dates uh, start to pressure you. I mentioned seasonality a while ago, rainy season, dry season. <clears throat> Here we have in this example, an unusually high test result. You can see that this particular source uh, has crazy contamination levels in July and August. So if you know that's possible, uh, then you can, in your microbial water management uh, profile, you can actually enact preventative or corrective action measures to make this more uh, even throughout the year. So again, here's some examples. What's your water source? So it's surface. How do you apply the water? Overhead. Uh, when do you apply? Near harvest. So is that risky or not risky? Well, this is probably the most risky scenario I could come up with. Surface water, overhead application, right near harvest. That, that's the three worst things that you could have in determining uh, in resulting in a high food safety risk. So let's look at the next example. Oh, uh, I need to go back. Let me see. Sorry, I got trigger happy here. Number two, what's your water source? Surface. How do you apply the water? Drip. Not a direct water application method for the crop. When do you apply it? Near harvest. In fact, it's even irrigated during harvest. Uh, these are tomatoes growing there. So uh, would this be a high risk or a low risk situation? Well, I would say this is as low a risk situation as you can have if you're using surface water. And if you assume your surface water meets uh, the standards, this is very safe. Drip irrigation does not uh, touch the fruit that will be consumed. And so uh, even if you're doing it two days before harvest, it's not going to be a problem, assuming you don't drop the fruit, uh, the vegetable uh, of the tomato on the ground, etc. Records. I'm just gonna leave this up here. And I would urge all of you to go into the archived uh, session and just look at number 40 and ponder that for a while, print off a copy and put that next to those other sheets I told you earlier to put where you can see them. You have to know findings of your inspection water system, water test results, monitoring of water treatments, corrective measures, scientific data or information to support whatever corrective measure you took so that it would be in compliance, 
and uh, any alternative indicators or sampling frequencies. So if you just keep records and you pay attention to them and you put those in your microbial <clears throat> water quality profile, it should uh, minimize your potential uh, water quality uh, or food safety problem from poor quality water. And uh, that'll give you indicators of, of what you can do in your management system. So what do we know in summary? We know that contaminated ag water is being implicated in foodborne outbreaks on fresh produce. Uh, and the literature and the foodborne outbreaks uh, of con using contaminated water on produce far exceed those in meats or eggs uh, or anything else because what do you have? You have a product that's contaminated that you're going to consume raw. And if you get a high enough uh, amount of that uh, pathogen in your system to have an infectious dose, you're going to have a, a food safety uh, occurrence, of whether it's E. coli or whatever it is, and there will be a sickness. And depending on the health of the individual or the age of the individual that gets sick, uh, there are varying degrees of severity. You got to know water quality over time. Uh, if the water is not applied by direct method, you've got lower risks. So think about, uh, you know, your irrigation system. The time between last application and harvest reduces risk if you have a water quality problem. You can treat your water, but I'll tell you now, it's expensive and it's tedious. And if it's very major, uh, you know, it, it may not uh, be economically feasible for you. Keep copies of everything you do related to your water quality and document all your practices. Uh, if you document that you've tried to manage and that you've done what you can do, uh, you'll be better off than if you don't have any records and you have to sort of make them up on the fly. So, <clears throat> Brian, I'll stop there. Uh, this is this is not a simple thing, but it's nothing to be panicked about because uh, FDA is being, I think, uh, quite reasonable and methodic uh, about uh, trying to look at some of the issues that have that have caused objections from people. And you know, I'm not out here beating the drum of government, but certainly. Uh, they are being responsive and listening. So uh, as we find out things, uh, actual compliance dates and other things, we will post these on our website for your information. So Brian, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you, HL. Um, so now would be a great time for you to use the questions box in your control panel to type out any questions that you might have about this presentation. Uh, that uh, HL might be able to answer for you. And uh, while you're thinking about your question, we will go into the live polling feature of the webinar, and I'll kind of walk you through how this works. Uh, this is kind of the fun part of the presentation, uh, the interactive part of the presentation, certainly. And uh, it's pretty easy to participate. So everyone uh, that has a smartphone, um, go ahead and Grab it now, and there's a couple of ways that you can participate in the poll. You can either use your the browser on your phone to do your web voting uh, using the website, or you can vote using uh, a text message. And I'll tell you a little bit about each one of those options. If you want to use the text feature, You'll need to send a text to 37607, the number that you see on your screen there. And the message that you're going to send is HL Goodwin 156. And when you send that message, you'll get a message in response that basically lets you know that you've been admitted to the poll 
and every response that you send after that will be uh, your uh, a letter response to the questions. So the text you can you can participate in the poll by using the texting feature, or you can actually go to the website that you see here on the screen, which is pollev.com/hlgoodwin156, and when you go to that website. It will pull up. It will pull up the the poll that we're about to participate in. So here we go. The first question in our poll is: Which term best describes you? And you'll see some options there. All you need to do is uh, type in one of those letters that you think is uh, your what fits you the best, and just text it over to us. Or you can just select that uh, on the uh, if you're using the web polling, you can just select that answer. And I'll give everyone a, a minute to punch in their responses. All right, and we'll move on to our next question. In what region do you live? And these are the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs regions. So just punch in uh, the region that you live in or perhaps the region uh, where your operation is if they're different. All right, we'll move on to our next question. If you are a grower, what is your primary crop? All right, we'll move to our last question. If you are a grower, what is your average annual gross sales? All right. Okay, HL, I believe that uh, brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, I'll remind everyone that if you want to submit a question, uh, that you can use the questions feature in your control panel and uh, send that question over. And uh, I'll read it out loud and give HL an opportunity to respond. Uh, while you're thinking of any questions that you might have, just a reminder that this is a uh, two part presentation on agricultural water. Uh, we've just watched the first part of the presentation, and the second part of the presentation will be on November 7th. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, visit our website. Uh, you, you'll see the web address on, our screen, on the screen there. Um, if you go there, you'll see uh, the registration link for the second part 
of this series and also the remaining webinars that we have uh, scheduled this year. And I would encourage you to, to definitely register for uh, as many as you think you can attend and also uh, to pass the word around uh, to folks that you think might be interested um, and certainly encourage them to register as well. Um, HL, I'm not seeing any questions coming in. Did you have any uh, final thoughts before we end today's webinar? Uh, no final thoughts except just to remind everyone that the second uh, webinar on water will cover post-harvest water use. So it's, it'll be different than uh, this one. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, HL. And uh, seeing that we uh, don't have any any questions uh, for today's presentation, then I will go ahead and end today's webinar. And I want to thank everyone for attending. And hopefully we'll see you uh, right back here on November 7th. Very good. Thank you, everyone. All right.